This is Dr. Christopher Sendi with Nova Health Recovery Ketamine Infusion Center, and I want to discuss ketamine failures in depression therapy and trying ketamine. Now, uh, this is actually a, kind of a, a discussion of a, a story that was posted in the Washington Post in February 12, 2023, and uh, the author basically says, I tried ketamine to treat my depression. It was terrifying. The psychedelic therapy is said to help many people, but some, like me, have scary experiences. And, and so, yeah, it is true that ketamine therapy is not for everyone. You know, ketamine therapy treats biological mood disorders. It treats the underlying biological nature of depression and anxiety, but it doesn't treat the behaviors and the habits that develop because of those particular mood disorders. It doesn't treat or alter maladaptive behaviors and maladaptive habits that don't work out very well and have maladaptive results. And so the other question is, you know, did the person undergo preparation for the ketamine therapy regarding what it can do and what it can't do and how it unfolds? How does the treatment process happen? And what do you feel like during it? And what should you expect? And what should you not expect? And the other thing is that is the therapeutic journey to wellness supposed to be effortless and pain-free? What are your expectations? Is everything supposed to be joyous and happy during that whole treatment process? And so there, this kind of begs the question, are you fully informed about the amount of work that you need to put into this treatment and what to, to expect as far as the outcomes? And the question we frequently get asked at Nova Health is, you know, can I just try this treatment and call it a failure if I don't complete it and I have one or two sessions and it just doesn't seem to make a difference? So the last question would be, was the person who failed ketamine even given the correct protocol? And, and that's kind of where this story goes in the Washington Post. You know, it really, it, it's critical that the dose and the frequency and the route of administration of ketamine is followed because that's where the most medical-based evidence is present, is IV ketamine. And so what this particular story in the Washington Post is about, it's a story of how not to do ketamine therapy. And so the way that this story goes in the timeline, again, you can certainly locate that story just by looking it up on the web. Basically, the client, he's 65 years old, in a history of depression, suicidal ideation, meets with a Yale-trained psychiatrist, as he puts it, after being referred by his therapist. And the patient mentions that he's read numerous credible studies demonstrating the fast-acting benefits of ketamine and that it's life-changing. And also mentions, you know, that these testimonials, you know, showed that, hey, I felt like a completely new person in a lot of the cases. And he discusses the consent and how he was briefed in the consent form and mentions not fully understanding all that the consent meant as he went through this process. And so two weeks later, this patient gets a dosing session. He basically waited two weeks to get his dose number one and uh, basically finds himself on the couch of this psychiatrist who was trained to administer the FDA-approved version of the nasal spray of ketamine, which is generally Spravato. And he ends up doing 100 milligram lozenges twice that day. And the uh, uh, patient then responds, hey, I felt this tremendous amount of darkness. It was just very sad, very gloomy type of an experience. And uh, the, the set of this whole thing was basically this late afternoon sun shining through the windows and wearing this blackout mask with soft background music that was being supplied. And so this was kind of his set. And, you know, again, uh, most people who get ketamine therapy don't really want to be, you know, in a bright room. And, of course, the blackout mask, the question I have with that is, you know, is uh, uh, the uh, uh, blackout mask something that the patients are given again and again, or are they throwaway kind of things, disposables? Because after all, you don't want to be exposed to the eye crud of somebody else before you. So it sounds like the person, the patient did not bring anything into this clinic whatsoever uh, when it uh, came to uh, the preparation for this. And so generally speaking, most people who are prepared for uh, ketamine therapy will basically be told to bring in their own uh, uh, eye shades and their own blanket potentially and also uh, their own music that they would use a uh, uh, kind of a noise canceling headset for. Generally speaking, ketamine therapies are kind of an inward experience. So basically the first dosing of, of ketamine therapy here was like 200 milligrams of lozenges and uh, that's a fairly high dose uh, and the patient basically had a very bad scary experience. And so there he is, treated alone with the psychiatrist in the room is what it sounds like. And 
basically the patient's negative outcomes at that particular time were then greeted with another 100 milligram dosing that was offered to him. And the patient was basically, you know, saying that I, I wouldn't try it again, except for the fact that they offered to me again at that very moment. And he felt uh, basically uh, uh, exhausted after the second dose and went home feeling deflated that he did not get the euphoria uh, that he expected. He did not see the, the teal-colored, fuchsia-colored moments that everybody else described. And, of course, uh, the patient refers back to the paperwork where he mentions it could take several sessions for ketamine therapy to work. And, and so that said, it doesn't sound like the patient even recognized what the protocol should be how many times per week, what the dosing should be, how this is being administered. I mean, basically, it just seems like there was absolutely no understanding by the patient. Now, whether it was described and the patient didn't hear it or whether or not there was just kind of this void of, of you know, what the next steps would be, I don't know. But based on the description here, it sounds like the patient really didn't know and wasn't explained what this process was. So, Bottom line is that the patient had a horrible experience, felt exhausted and, and deflated and didn't feel any of the positive benefits and hoped maybe it would kick in later. So then they get their second ketamine experience three weeks later. And uh, he, the patient states that, well, the consent form said the response tends to be sustained with repeated use, which is kind of funny because generally repeated use is within that short period of time, generally a series of infusions that uh, allows the person to consolidate these gains, not three weeks later. Um, so I'm not really certain what that meant, but in this case, the patient gets 50 milligrams of IM ketamine and describes panic and that his throat disappeared and no feeling when he swallowed and fearful of choking and wanted to get out of this particular situation. He was immobilized, locked in, in a state of distress and placed himself in danger, felt like he was dying for 45 minutes. And as a result, had no improvement. He felt detached, untethered, and immediately classified himself as, I'm in the 25% failure category. Well, I just want to kind of, you know, tear this down a little bit here because I mean, the fact is, yes, you know, uh, ketamine therapy is, is certainly associated with great outcomes, but the outcomes that are described, again, you don't know what the other patients have received. And again, each patient has their own individual journey and their own expectations or what is getting better is different for each patient. However, Ketamine infusion therapy is where the most evidence is. Most of the evidence demonstrates that persons should get ketamine infusions twice to three times per week for at least six sessions to get the maximal benefits. And that's where the 65, 70% improvement or remission rate comes from. And, and so the other thing is you have to look at testimonials is that, again, individuals who felt like a completely new person, uh, again, their situation may have been different and, and you don't know if what they were looking at as an improvement might have just been that they hit the nail on the head, whereas other people, some things did improve, but it wasn't what they wanted to improve. And we'll discuss that here shortly. The other issue is that, you know, this uh, psychiatrist, he sounds to me like this was an experiment on this patient. I mean, there's actually no evidence saying that the treatment plan should be 200 milligrams of ketamine and, oh, that didn't work out so well. So let me give you some more ketamine in the same dosing at the same session all by mouth and then followed up three weeks later with a shot of 50 milligrams of ion ketamine. There is actually no protocol like that. There's no evidence-based treatment behind this. So this was just an experiment on the patient and kind of just strung together by a psychiatrist that's supposed to be well-trained. And it sounded like this patient was supposed to get Spravato, which is FDA approved for in-office ketamine use. It's a nasal spray. It's S-ketamine. It's a mirror image of the other form of ketamine, the right-sided form. And uh, it is effective uh, for depression to a, a large extent and uh, suicidal ideation. But the patient instead received this alternate treatment, this kind of bizarre uh, oral dosing to kind of just, you know, put them in this state of, of negativity, which doesn't always happen. But you don't know what you're going to feel like if you don't have any history of psychedelic use or ketamine use. And the way that a person absorbs uh, lozenges is about maybe... 20% of, of the dosing. So if you get 200 milligrams, you're going to get 20 milligrams of ketamine uh, if you hold it under your tongue. And so that said, that could be a lot of ketamine for an individual who's very naive to it. But then think about 50 milligrams of IM ketamine given all at once. I mean, that's going to be a deep sedation for the average individual. 
And it tends to create dissociation. It tends to cause the person to get numbness in their face, in their hands, in their throat. They can't even talk. And so it, it is possible for a person to get glottic closure. And so the other question is, you know, you're having a psychiatrist do this to you. And how often do psychiatrists actually touch their patients and do blood pressure checks and do physical examinations or even know how to respond to an emergency? So what if he starts throwing up? What if he aspirates during that throwing up episode because he's altered? And what if the patient's just totally anxious or has some other low oxygen state that's clearly not being measured because you know the patient might have sleep apnea? And so does the psychiatrist have an ACLS card? Can he treat the patient for an emergency? Does he have oxygen? And also, is this psychiatrist alone in the room with this patient the whole time? So who's monitoring the psychiatrist? Again, people have delusions and hallucinations and paranoia sometimes during ketamine treatments, especially at really high doses. And so, you know, certainly patients are in a vulnerable state of mind. They aren't able to really control things and, and they don't understand their perceptual abnormalities and altered states of consciousness. So they could easily be taken advantage of. So, you know, that's a problem if the therapist or psychiatrist is sitting alone in a room with a person, especially if it's a uh, opposite, you know, uh, uh, male-female type pairing. And so, you know, again, this is, of course, going to be a scary experience because this person did lose control and they don't have to lose control in order to get ketamine to work. And how does ketamine work? Basically through neuroplasticity, ultimately, through basically the creation of new neural networks and repairing of new neural networks uh, that have been broken by depression. And so, Basically, this patient considers himself a 25% failure category when, in fact, he didn't even go through what would be a classic treatment paradigm with IV ketamine, which is a series of six, and even more in some individuals. And this series of six is IV ketamine over two to three weeks, twice to three times per week at scheduled elevated dosings based on the person's weight. And so, you know, again, considering yourself a failure simply because you were given some really unusual kind of treatment that sounds more like an experiment than an actual plan, you know, doesn't really consider this uh, a failure for this person. So this unfortunate patient basically now is going to write ketamine off as a potential treatment when in fact it could work perfectly well for him. So what are the expectations in the process and what protocol is followed is really important. You know, everybody's experience with ketamine is different. And, and, you know, first, everyone's situation and condition is different. So everybody has this large journey that they come to us with. And it's important to get to know your patient so that you know what and where they came from and what they're expecting to improve and what can be improved by ketamine. And what ketamine protocol was used in a particular patient for them to say it worked or it didn't work? Was it the evidence-based Ketamine, which is infusions that are based on 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, uh, up to one milligram per, per kilogram over 40 minutes, twice or three times per week for at least six infusions initially, because that's where most of the evidence is. There's hundreds of trials demonstrating this should be how it's done. And so the other thing is everyone will show improvement at varying rates and varying amounts in the process. And, and this is why testimonials vary, you know, again, why? Because patients will see improvement differently. They are expecting certain parts of their lives to change, and maybe those parts don't change, but other parts do. And so the other aspect of this is that for some, they start feeling better immediately, and others, it may take number six or eight or even the 10th infusion before they start to see the needle change. And so what exactly was the person expecting to improve? Now, ketamine can only improve the mood. It can't improve your habits, behaviors, or the environment that you're in. It can't change your job, it can't change your family, your financial status, or the way that the person in front of you is gonna drive his car. I, you know, again, the ketamine is given to the patient, not to anybody else around you. So you're gonna be kind of walking back out to a world that is exactly the same world that you came from. But the point behind this is that you wanna have increased adaptability and resilience to deal with the day-to-day -day things that you're gonna face in life. So again, ketamine therapy can increase cognitive flexibility, the ability to see things differently, and adaptability to be able to change in the, in the presence of new stresses and challenges, and resilience to bounce back when you do get dinged around. But you need to put in the work to change these maladaptive behaviors and habits that basically have developed because of that low mood state. And these maladaptive behaviors and habits may have worked somewhat okay when you were depressed, but you know again, they aren't great 
choices and they frequently lead to just bad outcomes and bad choices and low fulfillment. And of course, that's going to make you stress because life just doesn't turn out the way that you want. So these are the things that therapy work and individual work, the internal healer has to deal with. And so again, recognize this treatment will not change your personality. It won't change your past. So again, you know, if you're a doctor, you're not going to become a lawyer. You have to put the work in to do that. You can't change things you've done to other people. Uh, you can't change you know, traumas that you've undergone in the past. But you can certainly find ways to reference those and find different ways to cope and, and move forward and learn from things in the past. If you're living in a toxic environment, that certainly will remain as well. And addiction issues will remain unless you treat them. So that requires continuing psychotherapy. And of course, ketamine therapy can lubricate the therapy process. So recognize that if you're stuck in therapy, ketamine therapy is really helpful for basically lubricating people that are stuck in that same hamster wheel type psychology. So this is why preparation is so important for the ketamine journey. I mean, when we are depressed, we get very short-sighted and we get very less self-aware. In other words, we can't tell when we're getting better uh, when we're taking a treatment and we're very short-sighted in that we want immediate results. If we don't sense that reward signal, we stop things before we give it a chance. And we also overestimate side effects. And so that said, we have these hot cognitive deficits, which I discuss in other uh, videos of ours, is that these hot cognitive deficits are kind of our lizard brain looking at everything in a negative way. Nothing is working out well, uh, it won't work well for me, and all the side effects are occurring to me. And, and of course, it also impacts our ability to follow up with follow up care. In other words, making our appointments and keeping them and recognizing the importance of, of adding other types of, of things in our lives and lifestyle changes. And also, we will be less aware of improvement when there is improvement and, and basically more reward driven for immediate results. If I don't feel that positive signal, I don't feel more like SpongeBob, and this isn't working for me. That's what we're going to think. And we're not going to give this the time uh, in, in terms of the ketamine process to actually allow this to work. And, and so that's why a lot of people drop out so early. So this is where the signal of ketamine can affect a person's perceptions of results. So if you're not feeling this blissful state, this positive affect during the infusion itself, you're going to think that ketamine doesn't work for you when in fact it doesn't have to give you any sense of joy or positivity. In fact, you need to be uh, uh, understanding of all your mood aspects and comfortable with touching negative thoughts as well as positive ones so that you're more centered. And so again, many blogs and testimonials describe bliss and euphoria and amazement and spirituality as the signal of the feeling of ketamine therapy. Well, you know, why does the treatment need to be considered working for you if you only have positive emotional states during the experience? So do we have to medicate away negative feelings that we'll experience at some point in our life? Or are we trying to learn to cope with and reframe and restructure ourselves so that we're more resilient to future stresses and endeavors that we'll be challenged with in the real world again and again and again? And that's the goal behind this is being able to flow between positive mood states and negative mood states, always knowing that we'll end up centered and balanced at the end of the day. And, and that's where we want to be. So I just want to mention that, in fact, ketamine therapy does affect the glutamate system. It's different than any other treatment out there. And the glutamate system is involved with learning and pain. And so when you get a, a ketamine journey, it generally is more insightful and cognitive. You're doing a lot more thinking than the emotional voyages that people typically see with psychedelic therapies, such as psilocybin, MDMA, which affect the serotonin system only. And so what do you expect? Well, expect that you're going to experience a nonlinear improvement through the ketamine process. In other words, there's going to be ups and downs. It doesn't just go straight off to the moon that you feel awesome every day and it's going to be better and better and better. Because, again, you can't expect straight up an improvement. There has to be some ups and downs. And your brain is, is always going to focus on the downward movements and that even though you may be better than you were at the start, these little bits of downward movements will basically be over uh, analyzed and they'll be overvalued by the negative side of your brain, which generally functions in a lot higher state when you're depressed. You always overestimate negativity. And that takes a long time to, to work through. So you also have to understand what components of your world are gonna be changed with any medication therapy, including ketamine. So ketamine therapy can't make you 
for example, clean your room or go to work or exercise. It can't make you like your spouse or like your job. And it doesn't make your boss like you. You know, those are things that your therapy work and lifestyle changes and, and other aspects have to be taken by you. The hard work has to be put in by the patient to make this happen and to, to make the other components of your medication treatment work, including ketamine therapy. So expect to put in work to make changes in your behaviors, your habits, and your lifestyle that impact your mental health. So you have to work on everything from exercise and eating well and sleeping, as well as not drinking alcohol and cutting down on marijuana and things of that sort, so that you don't medicate your way into a healthy lifestyle. You're basically transitioning to an entirely new lifestyle that works better with better outcomes. Whether you know, you're doing a weight loss program or addiction treatment or depression therapy, these are very similar because you don't just take a pill or a shot to lose weight. You have to exercise. You have to eat well. You have to add a lot of other lifestyle changes to make that happen. The same thing with addiction therapy. You have to also expect to re-engage with psychotherapy and therapy sessions to integrate all this new psychological flexibility that something like ketamine therapy introduces to you. And so again, you have to look at old treatments again that might have not worked before or didn't work or maybe did work and then quit working and now kind of maybe look at them and say, maybe I should reintroduce them just to make things even work better because ketamine can make your underlying medications work better and it can make older medications that you had stopped actually work well for you as well. And so there's a lot of ways to integrate traditional medication therapy with ketamine therapies. So what do you expect in the ketamine infusion experience? You should you know, basically become comfortable with your good feelings as well as bad feelings that you might experience so that you become centered and balanced. In other words, you know, we need to develop a good emotional baseline tone with appropriate responses to the day-to-day -day events that we're gonna see. Like, you know, for example, uh, I have a good outcome with a report at work and that's an awesome thing, but then, you know, somebody throws a rock at my car and it breaks the window and I should appropriately be mad at that particular situation. But these are kind of, you know, ups and downs throughout the day that we just kind of call moodiness, you know, and sometimes we just have this emotional baseline it kind of is just where we are. And then we have these basic ups and these basic downs, you know, where we kind of maybe just feel like we got on the wrong side of the bed or got on the right side of the bed. And, and that's what we want to develop. But you do have to recognize that the infusion of ketamine is going to be like a test pattern of emotions. And you need to become comfortable with not just happiness, the joy and the bliss, but also the fear and the sadness, the grief and cold and darkness that ketamine can introduce you to because the goal is to allow you to kind of dive into those negative feelings and experience them and, and, and live them and then just put them away when you're done with them so that you can kind of go back to a centered and balanced state so that you're comfortable with them, that you know that if you're feeling low and sad one moment that you're not going to catastrophize over it and say, well, this is the way I'm going to be the rest of my life, but rather, no, you know what? I understand why I feel this way and I'm going to feel much better in a couple of hours or maybe tomorrow. And so this allows you to sway between positivity and negativity, even when you're not getting ketamine therapy, so that you're basically more flexible in the way that you see things. So rather than seeing the night is so dark and, and cold, you're like, well, in two hours, it's going to be daylight. So it's a good way of reframing things. And integration with psychotherapy, which happens after ketamine therapies, meaning a day later, two days later, five days later, that's integration therapy, is to discuss these experiences and these new thoughts that you journal down during your ketamine treatments. And people will show improvements in varying ways, which some are noticed more by family members first and then the patient after. Because again, patients frequently can't recognize improvement where there is improvement and frequently just focus on side effects and negativity. And that's the hot cognitive deficits that we see, a lot of which is driven by this, this kind of negative side of our mind, the lower midbrain kind of ruling how we think. We've lost top-down control when we're depressed, and that's because of the loss of connectivity in key areas of our brain involved with executive functioning, insight, impulse control, decision-making, and reward processing. And when those are broken, we think more like lizards for immediate rewards, and, and that basically everything in the world is negative, which is what lizards think about. It's everything's out there to get them and kill them and eat them. And so when we get depressed, we think just like that too. And so we tend to not see positive things in, in, in this, the simple things that we're exposed to. And, and we tend to not sense rewards where there are rewards. So again, getting rid of that negativity takes actually even more time for the average person when they go through ketamine therapy. And also you have to recognize you do not need to lose control 
in a ketamine infusion. You do not need to dissociate to improve. So in other words, ketamine therapy is a very controlled treatment and it's based on your weight and you can escalate it with each infusion so the person gets kind of a more positive, insightful experience, but also is allowed to explore other emotional states in a controlled fashion and that they don't have to lose control and have fear because you've given them such a high dose, but rather the tolerability can be just matched step by step. And that I find to be very helpful for a lot of patients. So what are the next steps? You need to be always engaged in self-care and continued periodic ketamine boosters will always be needed from time to time to stay on top of your mental health. So you have to expect that this is a treatment, not a cure. There are no cures for de depression. Even your traditional antidepressants, you're on them for years and years because we know that, that in the one-third of patients that respond and have remission with antidepressants, that half of them relapse within the year back to depression. And that our self-awareness and emotional regulation are aspects of our mental health that need constant self-monitoring. It's hard for us to do that all the time. And so sometimes we do it through journaling and, and online apps, as well as just kind of asking other people how we're doing and how are we doing with our family, our work, our finances. Those are all things that we take into account. And remember that depression is a cognitive disorder. People lose the ability to, to think and to have decision-making, executive functioning and planning before they start to experience the typical depression experience of sadness and tearful and loss of interest, which then leads to just increased negativity and the hamster wheel thinking and low self-esteem and the self-sabotaging behaviors that we see. And, and so there is a, a, a constant slide down to this negativity. And so a lot of people kind of slide down to that low state of mind uh, at, a, at a rate that they didn't recognize and, and until finally they're starting to lose things in their job and their family. And so they lose a lot of fulfillment in life before they recognize that something's going on. That's why you need to stay up on top of treatment, to be proactive rather than reactive. So by the time you react to your depression, a lot of damage has already been done. And we know that depression is neurodegenerative. It's progressive with loss of cognition, brain fog, and cognitive scarring, as well as loss of executive functioning over time. And that results in medication is not working as well. Um, it basically uh, uh, will cause people to not respond to even therapy over time if they don't treat their depression and mood disorder uh, very aggressively. And that you also have to have lifestyle changes. You need to have continued changes in what you do and how you react to the world, how you exercise and eat. You have to understand also that there's no cure for mental health disorders, but rather the goal is remission so that you have no symptoms. And that is the state that we all want to be in. But then we, after that point in time, have to be on top of ourselves for maintenance. So what is a failure in ketamine therapy? Well, what are the benchmarks you're using for the improvement? Sometimes people want improvement in aspects of the life that medications can't help, like your job, you know, things that have happened in the past, how you grew up, traumas in your past, you know, those types of things, uh, your family, finances, um, those are aspects of your life that are only going to be adjusted by behavioral changes on the individual. And then also, did you work for your recovery? Again, it's a constant process of building up and you have to do lifestyle changes as well. And did the person expect their environment to change? And uh, you know, how about your personality? Those are things that ketamine therapy won't change. It doesn't change the people around you. It doesn't change the way people drive or think about you per se. Um, so again, you have to do all the work. You're the only person that can control what happens. You can't control other people around you. And the original problem, was it a maladaptive behavior and a habit issue that simply had poor outcomes that resulted in stress and then mood disorders? In other words, the behaviors created the mood or was it the other way around? And sometimes it's hard to dissect that out. So again, therapy and lifestyle changes can be really important as the first step for treatment for a lot of individuals. And they have to be willing to put that work in right off the bat. But sometimes getting the ketamine therapy allows the person to get more energy and it gives them the ability to put in that effort to make those changes. So again, ketamine therapy can work from both sides of the equation. But just remember, there are no medications to improve how you study or to make you clean your room, or to improve your work behaviors, or even your family interactions. That's up to you. The last thing is, did you work on addiction issues? Drinking, alcohol, marijuana, and also, you know, issues in the past. You know, are those things that would be changed, you, you know, with medications? And they can't be. 
So you have to recognize that, you know, obviously things in the past, uh, you know, certainly are, are issues that will not change with ketamine therapy, but how you respond to those issues, what you learn from them, what you move forward with, those are things you can work on. So the protocol for great results is the ones that are cited is there's 70% improvement in remission um, from traditional in, infusion practices and that three infusions per week at 40 minutes each that are weight-based with escalations that occur in a range as tolerated and based on clinical outcomes is the best way to get your, your results. And improvements are seen at any time in the process. And for some, it could take as many as 10 or more sequential infusions to produce changes. And that there's also incremental improvements with boosters and that maintenance may be needed. And recognize that home microdosing of ketamine can be really helpful for maintenance therapies and relief. But however, starting with oral ketamine and home-based nasal ketamines, it's a lot slower for them to work. And there's not a huge amount of evidence showing that that's the way to start off your treatment plan to get remission. It may produce relief, but it provides really minimal remission. And you wanna be in remission. And intramuscular ketamine in particular has few studies behind it demonstrating effective remission. So what's your protocol gonna be? You know, unlike IV ketamine therapies, where we know that, you know, the series of infusions of a weight-based amount with a particular protocol works better and gives these statistics, the rest of these made-up things, especially the experiment that this psychiatrist had on this patient in the article, you know, again, it, it's, it's just unknown what these other protocols are doing. They're just experiments. So it's all about timing, frequency, dosing, and lifestyle changes. So you have to expect that you're going to do the work and expect increased in emotionality in the treatment process. And know that this is nonlinear, that there's going to be ups and downs, and it's going to require work, and understand that this requires maintenance. This is a treatment, not a cure, and that it has the highest success rates of any other treatment. But to call it a failure, simply because during your infusion experience, you had some negative thoughts and some negative feelings, again, those need to be integrated ultimately into how this whole process helps you, how ketamine helps neuroplasticity to improve and correct the neural networks that are damaged by depression. And toning down negative emotional states takes a lot longer in the ketamine process than any antidepressant response. So back to the story. There is very poor medical-based evidence that oral ketamine can give you anything but relief. And it takes multiple, multiple weeks for this to work, not just one session like was given in this, this particular article. And it doesn't give remission. It just gives you a little bit of relief. And this is a low-potency treatment that this doctor provided with no evidence. And this is a patient that had chronic depression and expecting them to feel better with one oral treatment and then waiting three weeks for their next intramuscular treatment is absolutely ridiculous. So again, traditional evidence-based medicine says ketamine twice or three times per week is the way to do it and it has the best efficacy and length of response. And then mixed with ongoing integration psychotherapy that happens days after the treatments to change maladaptive behaviors and habits associated with the underlying mood disorder. This patient was given ketamine in oral and intramuscular forms. It's not controllable. It's definitely poorly tolerated, and there's low medical evidence behind them using it in this fashion. This was just some experiment that the psychiatrist made up, and the timing was random. So let's just try this on you is kind of where that went. And unfortunately, now this patient who was terrified by the experience has left a potentially viable treatment option on the table and will more likely never go back to this. And that's unfortunate for him. He should consider doing really a protocol-based, evidence-based type treatment as a series of ketamine infusions. It's completely controllable, highly effective, and understanding which emotional states he may experience during this process is critical so that they, when they experience them, will basically understand how this is part of their treatment process.